Life uh, growing up for me was very unsafe, if I was to use one word. Uh, my father was a heavy alcoholic. Um, violence was a normal part of our lives. And when I say normal, we would wake up at three o'clock in the morning to my mother screaming, being choked, being beaten, and we would just go back to sleep. Well, Matt and Sarah, thank you so much for being here with us today. We love the work that you guys are doing. We're so grateful for the work that you're doing. And we're really excited to kind of share this with our audience. So for anyone who's maybe unfamiliar, can you help our audience understand what She Is Not Your Rehab is? Um, She Is Not Your Rehab really started out as just a community initiative from our barbershop. So we never set out to create a big movement or even a campaign. It was just simply, I guess, a heartfelt response to what we witnessed in our community around uh, domestic violence and sexual abuse, um, also given that that was also Matt's experience. Um, So what started out as just a humble community I guess, outreach, turned into this crazy viral movement and now a book and different campaigns and projects that we've kind of undertaken. Um, And simply it's just an invitation for men to acknowledge that their childhood trauma wasn't their fault, but their healing now is their responsibility. And so I guess that sort of sums it up. Yeah. Well put. Yes. (laughs) So amazing. And then some of the inspiration, as you just mentioned, kind of came from Matt's own experience. Can you speak a little bit about what life was like for you growing up, Matt? Yeah, life uh, growing up for me was very unsafe, if I was to use one word. Um, My father was a heavy alcoholic. Um, Violence was a normal part of our lives. And when I say normal, we would wake up at three o'clock in the morning to my mother screaming, being choked, being beaten, and we would just go back to sleep, um, thinking that mom would survive it. Um, And so this cycle of abuse just really was so entrenched in our household that anything that we witnessed outside of our household, we just thought was nothing. Like it was was funny. We We would watch violent films, we would find them funny, or they were comedy. Um, because we would always compare it to our lived experience at home. And so having these conversations with me in the barbershop when I started cutting hair and sharing my story um, and that vulnerability when I was vulnerable with the men who trusted me with their hair, um, men started to open up to me. And I soon learned that I wasn't alone, that my story was not unique. It was the story of many men who suffered in silence. And I thought, If men are violent or the perpetrators or the monsters that society paints us to be, how come the men that are sitting in my chair are not these men? You know, they they were just getting on with life, wanting to be good men, um, but they just had no outlet or somewhere to express a lot of the shame that they carried. And so really that's where the barbershop, um, in the barbershop is where this movement really um, gave birth. Yeah. What kind of inspired you to start that barbershop? Um, I've always loved hip hop culture. So, you know, being a Polynesian growing up, you know, down under in New Zealand, we didn't have many superheroes. Our national sport here in New Zealand is rugby. Um, so rugby is our national sport. So most of the most famous rugby players ever were Polynesian men. And so if you weren't, you know, athletic like myself, um, my superheroes were the hip hop artists. And so I grew up, you know, watching and just looked up to rappers like Tupac and Biggie Smalls you know, watching videos of um, black artists, rappers, MCs, um, and just seeing the barber culture through those, through film, through videos, it really resonated with me. And so when I fell in, fell into barbering, picked up my first clippers and started cutting my own boys in my neighborhood, you know, they started talking. And I that, that part of the culture I loved, the conversation that um, men gifted me. And um, why do you think that the the men in your barbershop responded in the way that they did to the vulnerability that you expressed in sharing your story with them? I think we're all wired for connection. I think all of us want to be seen, a longing for belonging, um, just want people to, to be real with and connect with. And I think just me being vulnerable with my story, it, it really gave way for these men to open up. Um, and the more I opened up, the more they opened up. And the more we realized that we weren't alone, that we are more alike than we are different. Yeah, that vulnerability is contagious, I think, in that way. 
so, you know, you're opening up, with, you're having these conversations with these men, you're helping these men to be seen and known. How does that help break the cycle of violence or cycles of violence? Just speaking up, like, you know, uh, being a man, being a male, growing up in a culture where really you're forced from a very young age to not talk, um, especially in my culture, talking about domestic violence, sexual abuse, all these topics that are very uncomfortable is very taboo. You know, I, I've been talking about my story of family violence since the age of 15 and the pushback I've received from my own community, you know, being a young teenage boy talking about this stuff was real you know the pushback from my own boy saying bro we don't talk about this stuff like you're bringing shame to our culture you're dishonoring your mother and father talking about this stuff shut up um but the more i talked about it the more it connected with other people who i thought would never resonate with a brown boy story um who also experienced family violence at home and so i think it's a universal thing that we all share um shame is something that a lot of us will experience you know, uh, humiliation, a lot of men have experienced. Um, and what it's part of our humanity. I think when you deny those hard feelings that we try and, you know, ignore and sidestep and run away from, like you deny your humanity. So going back a little bit, you started She Is Not Your Rehab. Can you two talk about how that name came about? Well, we were talking about um, actually the topic of Matt's TED Talk on the couch at home, where all of the ideas for everything are birthed, usually late night um creative sessions um so Matt had been asked to give a TED talk and at the time he was actually quite hesitant he didn't really want to do it because he kind of felt like oh who am I to give a TED talk all the ones I've seen online are like academics brilliant minds you know scientists um I'm just this brown brother from the hood like I'm a barber like what have I got to offer and I was like, you've got so much to offer because it's not just your story. It's the stories of so many men that have shared with you over this season in your barbershop. And I think, um, you know, let's just think about or brainstorm topics that you would want to address. Like, who are you speaking to? Who would you like your TED Talk to resonate with the most? And he was like, well, I want to speak to my brothers. I want to speak to the men because that's who I talk to every day. That's my lane. Um, and I was just like, okay, so what are the themes you would like them to know, um, I guess, around, you know, our work and what you've been talking about? And then we started talking about his mum, who was obviously a victim of domestic violence her entire marriage. And um, and then we just got discussing it. And I was like, yeah, she is just not your rehab. And when I said it to Matt, oh. we were like, that is such a cool because I'd never heard that. It was just something that kind of just popped out just through, you know, conversation. That's how we birth anything, really, through conversation. And so I just went online and I quickly Googled it. And it wasn't because I just thought maybe I've heard it. Like, how did it, what? what? Like, that was such, such a good, like, catchphrase, I thought. Anyway, so I Googled it and I was like, oh, no, it's, it's nothing. It's nowhere. And so I just, I looked at the, um, you know, the website domains and it was available. So I registered it right in that moment. Like she's not your rehab.com. And I just sort of knew in my heart that that statement like kind of represented what we'd been doing for so long in the barbershop. So it wasn't like anything new, but I think the slogan was a fresh way of um articulating it. And yeah. And as a man hearing that, it was you know very provocative, very like mm, ugh, the punch in the guts. But it really stemmed from our relationship. Like she had been a woman who had not been my rehab center. You know, she had been, she was very clear with her boundaries when we were friends and then became romantic. Um, and I just like, I I knew that I didn't want it to be another movement where we would demonize men or shame men. Like I really wanted to invite men because I was working with men like every day. I'm talking to men every day. I, we didn't need another movement that was going to shame them and make them not come into the conversation. So it was really trying to navigate how do we bring men in by using the slogan that is very, you know, almost like a punch, um, is provocative, but then also inviting. And so to invite men into the conversation really had to come from us telling stories of the men in our communities mm -hmm. and starting first with us, myself, and then, yeah, it's grown into what it is. Yeah, and I think... Yeah. Um, just the, and to be honest, even then we hadn't decided this was going to be a big movement. We just thought it was a good way of like framing some of the conversation. 
And then um, from there, we decided to, um, everyone was going to do a haka after our TED Talk on stage. And I was just thinking, oh, what's everyone going to wear? And initially, we were like, should we put our barbershop logo on? Like, I wasn't really quite sure. I was like, Becky, just wear your own clothes. Yeah, and we were like, no, it's like, no, no, it has to look, you know, like a group collective thing. So I was like, oh, well, should I just make sure it's not your rehab T-shirts? And he was just like, nobody's going to want to wear those. (laughs) And I was like... Well, let's just do that. So anyway, we did the She Is Not Your Rehab um, logo, whipped it up. We got the T-shirts made, printed just for our community. And again, we just thought it was just for our like community. We weren't planning to sell them or anything like that. But then it went viral um, all over. Um, we did an article with a news outlet in New Zealand, and that went viral. And it had like pictures of the T-shirts and the haka and everything and what he'd been discussing. And then that got picked up overseas and that became one of the biggest stories from New Zealand for the year. And so it got huge like traction, went viral, and suddenly everyone was requesting these T-shirts. And I was like, what? Amazon ended up ripping off our brand and selling them on Amazon. Um, Nothing went to our work or anything like that. So we had to file a trademark Hmm. and protect what we created. Um. So that's sort of how it got birthed. It was, again, it was never really intentionally set up to be a big movement. It was just a community response. Yeah, which is incredible. And I think speaks to, you know, how well that slogan summarizes what it resonates so well with so many people, right? Because you brought this up, Matt, I'm curious to ask you, Sarah, you mentioned she was very clear with her boundaries initially and kind of in this healing process together, do you feel comfortable sharing at all what that what your experience was like in the healing kind of process, Sarah? Yeah, so I mean, I had already been single prior to meeting Matt for seven years, just over seven years. And I had undergone my own healing transformation. Um, I had come from a very abusive and a different way um, home. I'd been adopted into another family and not treated well. I'd ended up leaving home at 15 years of age and I ended up um, pregnant and had my oldest daughter when I was 19. Uh, And so I'd got, I'd sort of, you know, I'd kind of known what I wanted more or better for life. I just didn't really know where to begin. And when I gave birth to my daughter, I just looked at her and just thought, I want to be able to give you everything that I never had. I want to be the kind of mother for you that you deserve. And so I started working on myself. And what that looked like was a lot of ugly crying, (laughs) journaling, therapy, um, learning to affirm myself, learning how to have boundaries, set them. And I just decided in that healing process that I would intentionally be single. I initially thought for a year, and I thought that would be quite difficult because I really thought about my life and I had gone from, I'd had a boyfriend continuously since the age of 13. I constantly had these interactions and I seemingly attracted the same kind of person, someone who wasn't very evolved emotionally and who ended up hurting me because they were, you know, they didn't realize their own work needed. So I kept attracting the same old thing. And I thought I've been attracting the same old thing since I was 13 years of age. Um, How do I change it? I'm the common denominator. So I really sort of took responsibility for my own healing. And in that process, the one year actually turned into seven years who knew I knew that needed that much work um but but I discovered in that process that actually I didn't need to settle for just anybody actually I was worth um having standards I was worth um you know just having a life that I actually wanted and I think in that process because I had struggled with feelings of rejection and abandonment my whole life from being adopted I'd always gone to relationships almost a little bit out of desperation. Like you just needed to have someone, just anyone would be better than no one. And when I really embraced the fact of just being single and working on myself, I recognized the fact that I actually didn't need anybody anymore. I could actually be okay by myself. And so when I finally met Matt, um, we were actually just friends for four years um and so that was you know we were just genuinely friends and I knew all about him because we were just friends no one was trying to impress anyone I met him through work I've been working for a humanitarian organization we fought human trafficking and different projects around the world and 
I guess I just had come to this place in my life where I really was happy with myself and happy with my life. I was a single parent, but I had a great group of friends and awesome job that I loved. And so I think I, yeah, I came to our relationship completely different from how I'd come previously in other relationships. Um, and so after being friends for four years, he finally, you know, admitted to himself that he was deeply in love with me. Oh, wow. Um, and he asked me out. Because <laughs> when he actually asked me out, he said to me, look, I've actually loved you. I've realized that I've loved you more than a friend for the last year. But I really wanted to know that this was definite for sure because I wouldn't want to like muck you around or play with your heart um, because you've got a daughter and I wouldn't really just want to like date you just to see if it was okay because we're friends and I don't want to lose our friendship so he said I've really counted the cost and thought about this for a whole year and so I guess I'm asking you out knowing that I don't want to just ask you out I want to marry you and I was like wow hold up <laughs> you're asking me to marry you like this is crazy um so I really thought about it. And because I knew his story, I knew his history of trauma, um, abuse, um, physical and sexual. Um, I knew what he struggled with, um, including pornography. And I knew what I would and would not settle for um, being with someone. And so I was just really clear with him. I said, I really deeply love you. Like just even as a friend, um, I have so much love in my heart for you because you're just an amazing human being. The, the way that you're so gracious and forgiving and kind and loving, um, you know, all of this, you're an amazing person. Um, but in a relationship sense, I, was, I knew that there would be things that he would have to navigate. And I said, I can be like a supportive person for you. I can be in your corner. I can be on your team. I can cheer you along, but I will never be able to do that work for you. So essentially I didn't say at the time, but basically I said, I'm not going to be your rehab. So, and I was his first relationship after a long time too. So I was just like, so you're going to have to go to therapy and be committed to the process because I've been committed to my process for seven years and I know how hard it is and no one can do that process for you. Like you can have supporters, but you're ultimately going to have to do the work. And so he agreed. So he said, well, do you want to come along with me to my first therapy session? I was like, yeah, right up my alley. So we went along <laughs> and he was so, um, so vulnerable, so honest. And he just laid it all out and said to the therapist. It was pretty much the promises of the therapist. Yeah. Um, he said, to him, this is what I struggle with. Um, I want help in this area. And they got, and, um, and he just took it so serious. It was like he'd made this list of these are the things and areas I know I need to work on in my life. And addiction to pornography was actually one of them. Now, I um, totally come from understanding um, addiction to pornography. Like any addiction, there's a reason, there's a heart to it. It's a symptom. It's not, you know, the, the heart of why you do something. But I had worked um, for a long time in the humanitarian space fighting against human trafficking. And I guess I knew more than probably the average person did about the correlation between human trafficking and, and mainstream pornography. And so when I say mainstream pornography, I'm talking about, um, you know, places like Pornhub. I'm talking about, like, women who are literally, like, trafficked into the trade and actually forced to basically, um, you know, appear in these pornographic films and they don't get compensated for it fairly, if at all. And um, often they're, they're owned or trafficked into this. And so um, because I had, you know, worked in this space, I had met women who had been trafficked and rescued and, and we'd done work with them. I just thought, like, I'm not really willing to be with somebody who could essentially, for their own gratification, watch somebody be raped on their screen and be okay with that. And, and just having a daughter, I just thought I'm not having that kind of, like, life around me. And so I was just really super clear about that um I just knew that I couldn't um I would never be okay with that and I know there are relationships where people say that they're fine with their partner watching porn um and sometimes people do it together or whatever that just wouldn't be something I was comfortable with because ultimately I I said to him I remember having this big conversation with you um but I said you actually don't know the difference between a lot of these um channel like porn channels that you know men are consuming all the time you don't know the difference between people that are consenting and not consenting and while there are women that do consent and I'm not speaking to that I'm saying that there are many people that are literally being raped and you are just watching it 
and you, you're getting gratified by watching somebody get raped. And I said, if that was in real life and someone was just sitting in your bedroom getting raped on your floor while you sat there and watched it, like, how is that any different? And so I was just super, like, strict about that and went on and on about it. She and pretty much painted it out for me. <laughs> and that was a shock to me because I was like, she she really humanised everything that I had consumed from a young age, you know? I was just like, oh, my gosh, these people are real people behind the screen, you know? And I just, that never really, I'd never fit that in there. Like, that was just... It just never, ever came to my mind until I met her. Well, I think that there's this whole thing, and even now I'm quite aware of it as we consume the footage from Palestine. You know, if you were there in the physical sense watching children be tortured and murdered, how much different would your response be to watching it on your screen? Like, I think it's like, oh, yeah, like just scrolling. You know, people are just scrolling through social media seeing horrific videos right now coming from a war zone, which I guess, you know, in past wars, people haven't really had access to that. And so right. I think that there's something around, you know, it's on a screen. It's like watching a movie. It's not real life. It, people sort of, you know, I guess d okay. dupe themselves. Yeah, they disconnect from the reality that it is. And for me, having done the work for a while in that space of human trafficking, I was just like, no, like there's just like unless you're what like like how it is near impossible to tell who's consenting and who's not on uh, most of these mainstream um porn out there. So that's where it was for me. So as we can hear, someone is very very passionate about this topic. <laughs> well, also I just um. Like, especially because we did a lot of work in um, the the place I worked at. Um, it was called Tear Fund here in New Zealand. Um, they were an international partner to different um, projects in developing countries around the world. And we did a lot of work around human trafficking in Southeast Asia. Um, and I met a beautiful um, young woman who had actually been, um, I would say, use the word uplifted and, 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 and basically bought off her parents from a very poor village. And because of lack of education and poverty, her parents didn't really understand what she was going to do. So um, they willingly took the money, which was more money than they'd ever probably been given or earned. And she was um, basically trafficked into um, Bangkok, and forced to not only become, um, you know, a sex worker there, but then they would also film her and make um, films and it would all go online as a young woman. And so I'd met her, she had travelled around through our work and she'd come to New Zealand and done some work and talked about it. And to be honest, just meeting women like that and just, and, and two men that have consumed the videos that she's been in, she's just a, just a number, like she's nothing to them. Whereas when you heard her whole story and you met her in person and now the work that she's doing, amazing, it just really brought to life the fact that we, especially in West, the Western world, are so disconnected from these women behind the screens. And so after that, just meeting her and hearing her story and hearing the stories that she shared of other women like her, I just always vowed that I would do what I could um, in you know, the Western world that I lived in, New Zealand, to educate people around that particular trade because I just felt like it's not that men were innately evil who wanted to watch women being harmed. It was actually that they really just had no education around it. And actually when, so I wouldn't even just tell him, I would tell all his friends, <laughs> like, uh, you know, and he was like, wow, I didn't realize we were going to be having a porn education talk at dinner. <laughs> but um, I just really felt like, well, if you knew that, how different would your experience or interaction with it be? Because once you know you're actually responsible, it's not like you can just claim, oh, no one ever told me. I didn't really realise. I'm like, this is not just anything. So that's kind of, you know, I guess how passionate I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I just want to say, I think that's probably so validating for so many people to hear, but especially women who maybe are sometimes afraid to express, you know, their boundaries around pornography in their relationship because it is so normalized in society, especially for men to consume, but also for men if they are holding those same boundaries and they want to express that to their partner. I think it's important for us to to be okay saying, hey, you can be with me or not, but this is not something that I'm willing to tolerate and these are the reasons why. And I think helping to bring that education as opposed to just, you you could have just shamed him and said, oh, this is something you struggle with. I'm, I'm not interested, but you didn't. You educated him. And um, I'm curious to know for you, Matt, after you kind of knew this boundary from her and knowing kind of, if you don't mind sharing with us a little bit of your past with pornography and, and from 
you'd mentioned in your book from the time of your childhood, kind of how that was introduced to you. I'm curious to know then what that experience was like for you kind of being confronted by this as well from Sarah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I was, I'm a victim of sexual abuse. And so when I, but my first memory of sexual abuse, being sexually abused was at the age of three from an, my older brother's friend, best friend. Um, so he was a kid too, you know, not, not much older than I am. Um, and so sexual abuse was just, just ran rampant in my household. I was abused from men and women, babysitters, um, family members. And so when I found pornography, um, I can't even remember the age that I consumed it. I remember my dad having it around in videotapes, magazines throughout the house. Older siblings would watch it. Um, it was so normalized. Uh, my parents would have, you know, sex in front of us. My dad would rape my mum in front of us. Like sex was just a normal thing in my household. Um, and so my addiction was when I the 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 feeling of um, you know, the gratification of pornography was almost like my safe place. You know, it was almost like it was the top when I, whenever I would go through, you know having a session of pornography um i would always feel it was the most the time when i would feel just safe um because again like i said earlier in this this interview unsafe was the word that i would describe my childhood but yet in that moment when i would feel you know the ecstatic feeling after watching pornography would, i would just feel it's I would, I would feel safe in myself do you mean because it was like you you had control over it, it wasn't yeah. someone Some, no one was taking it from me or right, right. abusing me for it you know so it was my right. property to myself if that makes sense um and so it was an addiction you know I would do my the the worst the height of my addiction was probably seven times in one day um that I was watching it in the school computer um my teachers I remember my art teacher so graciously you know pulled me to the side and said Matt you know it's coming through to this the school office the stuff that you're watching and I'm like oh um, <laughs> you know snap but he said he had he had so so much kindness when he addressed it with me but that was the height of my addiction and so when I met this one here you know um who really educated me it was confronting as yes, because I had had no education on it um and then you know talking about the intergenerational trauma of the you know my story how it then led to my addiction to porn was just confronting as like you know I love this woman as a friend and then you know wanting to create this future future life with her and I wanted to be a dad and I didn't want to take you know that toxicity that trauma that pain and just carry on that cycle I knew I had to do the work and it was hard um you know early stages of our friendship relationship um, but I knew it was possible and I knew that so many of my boys you know we struggled with pornography you know I would have friends who would come to school selling uh, I mean we didn't have phones smartphones back then we were all you know my boys were selling pages of magazines you know at lunchtime they would sell a page for a dollar um, so I knew that I wasn't the only one that struggled with it um, but right. I was one of the first who started talking about it amongst my friends um, and even then, talking about this stuff back then was, you know, in the early 2000s was very taboo. Um, especially being a Samoan boy who grew up in church, Christianity was our faith. Like, we, no one ever talked about this stuff, even from the pulpit in church. No one ever talked about pornography um, in my community. You know, if anything, there was a lot of shame around it. And so when I met this one and Sarah really brought real woman stories to the forefront, and humanize them it just really challenged everything and I, I think it really connected with the humanity within me like as a yeah. kid who, who who was a victim of sexual abuse and now knowing that my best friend is working with women who have been sexually abused I'm like I'm part of the problem I'm adding to this you know toxic culture of um women being exploited um mm. and I knew like when I did the you know the spiel to him or the education um I just knew that I couldn't be with someone who would so selfishly want to gratify themselves at the expense of somebody else and so I just knew that I understood his story and I understood the history and that his first um 
you know, interaction with pornography was actually non-consensual. And so that's actually a way that many young people are actually groomed before they sexually abuse themselves as an older person, you know, shows them, um, you know, images or videos or whatever. So I had a lot of compassion and understanding for the fact that he had actually, you know, he'd been groomed from a young age to find this kind of stuff appealing. And I understood that it probably would be what he termed as safe or, you know, it would feel better than being raped or abused because you had, you know, control over it yourself. Um, but I just knew that there was a lot to unpack there, a lot of trauma, mm -hmm. um, a lot of sadness, um, a huge history. So I knew when I kind of said, you need to go to therapy, that he absolutely did and he would need to commit to doing the work needed to really heal that part of himself. And that was part of the attraction to her was really this was the first person in my life who I could share this, you know, very, you know, sacred stuff with and not feel, you know, taken advantage of, exploited, you know, all the stuff that she just said. Like she was the first person that I felt safe with and I could just yeah. lay all my dirty laundry out. And when I laid that dirty laundry out, she still wanted to, you know, help me wash it, help me clean it and still love me. You know, it was it was very. I felt safe enough to to go there and have these hard conversations with her, knowing that she would accompany me, not do the work for me, but accompany me and cheer me on. Um, yeah, and it's been the best thing, best decision I've ever made in my life. Uh, well, I think also yeah. I said at the time. I remember when you you said, "Yeah, I want to go do the work." I said, "I can handle anything as long as you're honest." Mm -hmm. That was a one like my one big thing. I knew that there would be <clears> potentially times where he would slip up or you know, I'd worked in that space myself. So I, I kind of knew it's not going to be an overnight quick fix. There's very few times it's ever going to happen. Um, so I just said, as long as you're honest with me, I can do this journey with you. But if there starts to be dishonesty, which is obviously like linked to shame and hiding and secrecy, I'm not down for that. So also that was another boundary. Um, and so he agreed. And so when he started doing the work, um, he went to a guy who really specialized in the work of unpacking the root cause of addictions and really um, looking at rewiring the way that you think about things and telling yourself the truth. Basically, it's a commitment to tell yourself the truth, which I love because I'm, you know, a very loyal um, believer in the truth. And and he, I remember he just gave you this list of things, which I think we shared in the book, didn't we? but a list of um, truth coaches or insights for him to really repeat in his own mind, just the truth of what it was. And I think it, it, as he went through the list, it was like, it was, you know, it was confronting. Like I remember one of them was like, um, you know, the, the girls will never really get much older, but I am going to get older and I do not want to become a dirty old man. Hmm. And I remember, I remember you thinking, when you were reading them through, you were like, oh my It would always hit me. I would read it every day. They, they were like positive affirmations to myself. Like, you know, the more you feed this dog, one one day this dog will eventually get big enough and it's going to eat you up, you know? And I was like, I do not want to be this dirty old man, you know? Well, because um, he talks about the, the therapist at the time and he was an older, very wise, older man who, you know, done a lot of therapy with a lot of men that struggled with this. He said, you know, there comes a point in um, this journey where you feed this so much, you're going down a slippery slope. It will be near impossible for you to climb back up. You don't. You're, you're young enough now. You can rewire that part of your brain. You can deny yourself um, these certain things which have just come naturally to you from such a young age. Um, but the older you get, the harder it will be near impossible. And I remember he was just like, I don't want to be that man. I don't want to be that. And so he just started doing the work. And I remember um, after the session with the therapist, there was one time where you watched porn again and he told me, and he like told me the same day, oh, I just want to tell you. And it was like he felt so embarrassed and ashamed. And I just remember thinking, I didn't, because I had done the work in myself, I wasn't a woman who associated that with me. I didn't believe it was because I'm not worthy or I'm not i'm lacking or it's because you don't find me attractive i didn't link any of that to myself so i could literally sit with him on the journey and i appreciated his honesty and i was like well you know um, i appreciate your honesty um and then you know he saw the therapist again and kept going 
Um, and now I don't even know how how long has it been since you've viewed pornography. Before we were married, <laughs> um, we've been married think, eight years. So. It was before I had our son. So yeah, our like... son's eight, almost nine now. So that's a long time. And I remember yeah. just feeling at the time like I just knew that he could do it because he's someone who. He's, well, for one, he's very respectful of women. And so I knew that, especially of his mother, I knew that once he really understood the enormity behind what you're just consuming, that he wouldn't be someone that would just be okay with that. He had a conscience. He couldn't be okay with that. And it would just be breaking the habits that had set him up to have this addiction. And he was willing, so willing to do the work and so willing to be honest. And that's what me and the therapist were like, your honesty is what will keep you going and what will do this. And, and transparency is massive. Like, yeah, I think especially with the line of work that we work in now around intergenerational trauma, a lot of my work for myself, doing the work myself was really to trace, trace the trauma, mm. um, face the trauma and then replace it, you know, replacing of new things. I had never been in a relationship where I could just be completely my, 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 my authentic, honest self until Sarah, you know? And so Sarah had really replaced a lot of these um, toxic beliefs I had about myself, you know, the unworthiness, the I wasn't, you know, I'm not good enough. Like, who could really love me knowing all this dirty stuff that I had, you know, hidden for, mm. for so long, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, and because I was so adamant that it was, just wasn't something I could live with in my relationship. So I was like, well, I'm not going to force you to do anything. This is your decision. But if this is something that you're not willing to give up for whatever reason, then you're a consenting adult. You can do what you want, like with adults. Um, you 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 can go and live that life, but I won't be able to be in it because it's just not the life I would want. Um, and because it's not I, the stuff you want around your daughter. No, it wasn't anything I want around my daughter in my home. And because I was really like adamant like that, um, he just always knew that it just wasn't really a fitness discussion, but also, mm -hmm. um. I when I we'd done the therapy session together and you know and the therapist had asked me for my perspective and you know what I thought and you know different things and he had kind of, I'd shared what I'd said and stuff and then the therapist said you know the thing is you've got a choice to make you can either you know this woman's saying she does want to be with you but this is a non-negotiable for her so either you go down the path of fully leading into this and doing the work or you keep up your addiction and then you're going to have to lie and hide, um, you know, to cover it up because she's saying she won't be with it. So you've got, that's your options. And I will tell you now that any, your dishonesty is what is the first killer of intimacy. Hmm. And so I just remember thinking, yeah, and I'm not willing to negotiate that. Um, so you either be all in truthful, you live this life or you don't like you know you make the decision and because that was the decision he had a clear decision it wasn't like oh but maybe or I will put up with this I won't I will not put up with this it is a non-negotiable for me just as it should be for anyone who would want some like the person that they choose to be with to be gratified by somebody being raped I just not something I'm down with and so just having everything spelt out clear and having the accountability and having a therapist who was very skilled in that area. Um, yeah, that's how we, I guess, walked through that. And so by the time we got married, it's never been a part of our marriage, um, you know, in any way in our relationship. And I feel like anything can be addressed and talked about. And sometimes I'll say, has there ever been time where you're still tempted to look at it or whatever? And he's like, well, no. And also because we, we live such a busy, full life now of so much experiences. When would I even have the time to be sneakily running around? To, like, we're so busy. Like, we literally fall asleep talking about the work we do. Like, that doesn't even sound very good. But we live this <laughs> full life now with our children, with our family, with our community, with um, the purpose that we have around eradicating domestic violence. Like, I feel like he said before I would feel like I didn't have much going actually. And so I had a lot of spare time on my hands to be doing things that I I don't think I would have done had I, you know, had other things to do. So I think that's partly it, isn't it? Like, yeah. I think it's, it's so awesome. go ahead. Sorry. Well she's just she's just filled that hole in my heart, you know. if you know, if if trauma if the the root root of trauma is wound, like my wife has filled that you know, that their wound, their wound's been, yeah. 
And I think it's really beautiful that she did that without being your rehab, right? She um, was still able to take care of herself and kind of acknowledge that just because there was an explanation for, you know, the history that you had and why you had it, it wasn't an excuse to continue kind of down a path of something that was going to be destructive in your relationship. So I think that's so beautiful and speaks really to the core of what you guys do. And I wanted to mention, so you have a lot of different phrases. She's not your rehab. She's not your mother. She's not your punching bag. Um, but there's one in particular, she's not your porn star that obviously, you know, we've spoken about this a bit, but can you, you mentioned this in your book and this is how it sounds like you're speaking to men about kind of understanding. Can you Tell us a little bit about what you mean by that and also how you're sharing that message with men beyond what we've already spoken about with the connections between trafficking and personally in your relationships. Yeah, the heart of writing that chapter was to really humanize, you know, because I know a lot of young boys, they consume porn. And then when they go into relationships, they expect the woman that they're in a relationship with will be will act like a certain way, act like the porn that they're consuming, but it's so far from reality. And so it was really just, uh, we wanted to write a chapter on something that a lot of men struggle with or consume to invite them to see that women are not, they're not performative creatures who you consume, you know, when you're by yourself. They have real people who have real hearts, real feelings, real emotions, real experiences. Real vaginas. <laughs> and um, also I feel like um, mainstream porn has so much to answer for in relation to domestic violence and I know this because um, for a few years I worked on the phone lines in New Zealand um, the national lines where people ring about domestic abuse and there was a huge big surge um, you know and during my time there of young women ringing up um, basically saying you know I'm in a relationship I wouldn't consider it to be abusive but when we have sex he wants to choke me and choking and strangulation became um, something that even our health professionals in the hospital, ER, all of that kind of thing, they would see a lot more of it come in because mainstream pornography had, uh, I guess, glamorized and normal normalized strangulation as being something that you could consensually do in this healthy sexual relationship. And also, um, you know, books like Fifty Shades of Grey, in other words, just normalized it. But the reality is around strangulation um, is that actually most young men don't know the power or their own strength and they wouldn't know when to stop. And even if she had, you know, said, oh, yeah, no, I consent to doing it because I don't want to really say no, I want to be, you know, explorative and I want to be open to trying new things, then she would ring and be saying, well, actually now I feel really deeply uncomfortable. I did consent to doing it, but actually I blacked out. Actually, um, I've now had really bad headaches after. Actually, like I'm afraid Wombs of Fed killed me when I blacked out, like all these things. And so when we wrote that chapter, um, we wanted to kind of just really, uh, I guess, draw that line between something that you're consuming that isn't actually reality on a, in a porn film, that is not a real experience of someone that's in a respectful relationship um, having consensual sex mostly, um, we wanted to, you know, really highlight the fact that actually what you've seen and consume is not going to be able to be done in a real relationship where you actually care for and respect the person you're with. And for so many of the young women that rung me, they almost felt embarrassed now that they had consented to it and now they didn't know how to say, actually, I, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't want to do it. And so we, we on the lines actually had to tell them every single time part of our duty of care was to explain that actually he could kill you. And it's not because he would want to kill you. This isn't like a guy who wants to be violently hurting you. He's thinking this is normal because he's watched it so much in porn that he wants to try it out with you and he doesn't realize his own strength and now he's killed you. Like this is the reality yeah. and he won't know he's not trained in this area and there is no real time where that's actually a safe practice. And so you'd have to try and explain that and educate people. But because porn has done a terrible job around showing people what is, you know, safe for people, I, I really believe that there is a huge work needing to be done for our young men because it's actually not their fault per, per se. They've been shown things, sometimes non-consensually like Matt was as a young person, but older kids, family members, whatever, and they've started watching it and consuming it. 
I mean, the statistics that I know through, um, you know, professionals I know that work predominantly in that space are that our young people are learning more about sex through porn than any other form of education. So I just feel like we, in that book, in that chapter, we wanted to highlight that because um, it's hugely harmful and unsafe for women and it directly correlates to our work in family violence. This wasn't on our prepared question list, but I do know that in the bio Haley sent, um, it mentioned that you have your uh, created a successful book club in prisons and you've gotten your book into. Can you speak at all about what that has been like or the impact that you've seen that have? Yeah, well, the idea, the dream of getting our book into prisons first was because my father had, you know, been inside, in and out of prison my entire childhood. And I was the kid at home who always prayed and hoped and dreamed that every time my dad did a long lag in prison, that something would have sparked change in his mind or the light bulb would have turned on. He would come out and stop abusing mum, stop abusing us. But unfortunately, that day never came. And so I said to wifey, my dream when we write this book is I would really love it if every person incarcerated in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, could receive a copy for free. And so she took this dream to our publisher, Penguin, um, and Penguin looked at her like, um, eh? we, we want to sell books, make money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we ended up getting the books at like um, a wholesale rate, so we didn't make money off it or anything like that. And we just raised the funds ourselves and bought the copies and ended up getting them to every person incarcerated in New Zealand. So, And we're about to roll that out through Australia as well. So hopefully... Um, other prisons around the world can um, do it because of the effect and the response, it was hugely worth the investment. Yeah. Um, I think it worked out to be just over $10 a book wholesale or, you know, a price that we got for buying so many. I think we bought like 10000 Um, But the letters back from those books from incarcerated men, um, the private messages from their partners on the outside, from their children, who's, you know, the men have read it inside and they've said, um, like, Dad rung and apologised for the first time ever because now he understands what he's done um, and he understands the correlation between his childhood trauma that was similar to Matt's and to how he now perpetrates violence onto them. And so uh, we just really believe in the innate um, redemption um, the potential in every single person. And I just refuse to believe in a world where people are not redeemable and so our hope in getting the books to prisons were that the way that we talk in a compassionate, empathetic way to understanding trauma, but also to take responsibility of your healing and the way you hurt others, um, you know, that would be freely and available and accessible for all people. Um, not everybody has the opportunity to go to therapy for a huge amount of reasons. Um, obviously, affordability and access is, is something that we really need to think about when we create solutions of healing. Um, so our book was really, the desire of our book was really that it could go to many places that um, that traditional ways of healing perhaps are not accessible. Mm. That's really beautiful. And, you know, some people listening might think these issues are so massive and widespread and dark in some ways and, and wonder, you just spoke to the redemptive potential of people being hopeful for you, but if you could kind of share a hopeful message with anyone who's maybe perpetuating a cycle of violence due to their own childhood trauma or struggling with a pornography consumption habit or addiction or, you know, anyone who's affected by these issues, what would you two have to say to them? I would say to all my brothers, if you are listening, like my wife said, you know, your childhood trauma is not your fault but your healing is your responsibility because what we do not transform, what we do not transform, we will transmit and we will transmit that onto our most vulnerable, which is our children and our partners. And so I'm living proof. We are both living proof that you can grow up in dysfunction, abuse, toxicity. We grew up in that the first 15 years of our life and you can then dream of being something else and then actually be something else. Like it is possible to change a narrative I'm living proof that what is possible, it can be done. It requires work. And I think um, it, it's hard work, but it's also hard work. Mm -hmm. Like we can all change that narrative. Um, my encouragement would be just to really consider, um, you know, in your heart of hearts, just really um, take a moment to sit with yourself and picture the life 
that you really truly desire and the the kind of person that you really truly want to be and then imagine that person in that life and what would the steps be to get to being that and experiencing that kind of life because innately I don't I've not met one person who could tell me that they long to wake up and terrorize and torment and harm other people um no one really sets out to be that monsters are not born in this world they're created with years of um you know inability to access mental health care um systemic failure failings trauma abuse but actually I truly believe that it's possible for us to come from that and then be something else. And it starts with us imagining something else. It starts with us picturing who it is we want to be and the kind of life that we really want to have. And we deserve to have that life. And I think my encouragement to those that come from homes like ours is that we aren't someone super special. We're not super talented. We're not super anything. We're just average everyday people. We started in a barber shop sharing with what we had to our community. Um, and so what I'm saying by that is not to minimize us and our work, but to really say that anybody could do this. Like, it's not like we had to have PhDs in this. Like we started with um, the healing that we had to do inside of ourselves. Anybody can start with that. And it can just be small attainable little steps if we just get into the habit of thinking of the next right thing that we could do instead of like creating this huge big overwhelming list of things to become this person everyone can just do the next right thing and take the next step and so that's probably my encouragement that's so beautiful and so encouraging thank you both um how can our followers support the work you're doing or learn more about you or access your resources well, just check us out on sheisnotyourrehab.com or on socials at sheisnotyourrehab. Um, at the moment, we're actually trying our best to raise funds to continue our work. Most of our work is actually self-funded, um, which used to be funded by the barbershop, which Matt ran, but we've actually had to close our barbershop because this work has taken over. Um, so now we tour and we speak and we do a lot of education around this. But we are at the moment selling limited edition art prints, which are all available on our website. Um, the art prints came from our exhibition that we cur curated last year called Who Is She?, which came about after we submitted a global call out to men everywhere asking them if she is not your rehab, then who is she? Um, over 3,000 men submitted words and we picked 101 of those words and we made them into artwork and had a gallery in New Zealand and showed that work. And now we've made a limited edition print run of all the artwork. And so each one of those prints um, is uh, available for purchase and the money actually just goes to further all of our work including getting our books into more prisons or um, working on the continued development and promotion of our free men's mental health app because everything we try to do um, and offer we want it to be freely available for those that perhaps can't financially afford it so we have to try and find other ways to fund it so if anybody wants to make a generous donation and purchase an art print we would really appreciate it. I just want to say I feel so encouraged and so grateful knowing that both of you exist in this world and are doing the work that you're doing and from such a you know grounded and rooted place you know it's very apparent that you deeply care about those in your community and want to help affect change um, so please don't stop and um, to our followers please support the work of She Is Not Your Rehab so that uh, Matt and Sarah can continue doing the amazing work that you're doing so thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you for Thank having, having us. us. This podcast is made possible by Fighter Club. If you're looking for a way to become a more active part of this movement, consider joining Fighter Club today. For as little as 10 bucks a month, you can create a real impact by supporting our efforts to educate and raise awareness on the harms of porn. Plus, by joining, you can get insider info, 30% off all Fight the New Drugs conversation starting gear, access to our secret store, and an exclusive Fighter Club kit sent to you when you sign up. Join Fighter Club today at ftnd.org forward slash join FC. That's ftnd.org forward slash join FC. See you in the club. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. 
Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and a non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. Check out the episode notes for resources mentioned in this episode. If you find this podcast helpful, please consider subscribing and leaving a review. Consider Before Consuming is made possible by listeners like you. If you'd like to support Consider Before Consuming, you can make a one-time or recurring donation of any amount at ftnd.org forward slash support. That's ftnd.org forward slash support. Thanks again for listening. We invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.